Chapter 2 The bunkhouse was a long, rectangular building. Inside, the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted. In three walls, there were small, square windows, and in the fourth, a solid door with a wooden latch. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets, and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Over each bunk there was nailed an apple box with the opening forward so that it made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk. And these shelves were loaded with little articles, soap and talcum powder, razors, and those Western magazines ranchmen love to read and scoff at and secretly believe. And there were medicines on the shelves and little vials, combs, and from nails on the box sides, a few neckties. Near one wall there was a black cast-iron stove, its stovepipe going straight up through the ceiling. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. At about ten o'clock in the morning the sun threw a bright, dust-laden bar through one of the side windows, and in and out of the beam flies shot like rushing stars. The wooden latch raised. The door opened, and a tall, stoop-shouldered old man came in. He was dressed in blue jeans, and he carried a big push-broom in his left hand. Behind him came George, and behind George, Lenny. The boss was expecting you last night, the old man said. He was sore as hell when you wasn't here to go out this morning. He pointed with his right arm, and out of the sleeve came a round, stick-like wrist, but no hand. You can have them two beds there, he said, indicating two bunks near the stove. George stepped over and threw his blankets down on the burlap sack of straw that was a mattress. He looked into his box shelf and then picked a small yellow can from it. Say, what the hell's this? I don't know, said the old man. Says, positively kills lice, roaches, and other scourges. What the hell kind of a bed you giving us anyways? We don't want no pants, rabbits. The old swamper shifted his broom and held it between his elbow and his side while he held out his hand for the can. He studied the label carefully. Tell you what, he said finally, last guy that had this bed was a blacksmith, hell of a nice feller, and as clean a guy as you want to meet. Used to wash his hands even after he ate. And how come he got graybacks? George was working up a slow anger. Lenny put his bindle on the neighboring bunk and sat down. He watched George with open mouth. Tell you what, said the old swamper, this here blacksmith, name of Whitey, was the kind of guy that would put that stuff around even if there wasn't no bugs, just to make sure, see? Tell you what he used to do. At meals, he'd peel his boiled potatoes and he'd take out every little spot, no matter what kind, before he'd eat it. And if there was a red splotch on an egg, he'd scrape it off. Finally quit about the food. That's the kind of guy he was. Clean. Used to dress up on Sundays, even when he wasn't going no place. Put on a necktie, even. And then, set in the bunkhouse. I ain't so sure, said George skeptically. What do you say he quit for? The old man put the yellow can in his pocket, and he rubbed his bristly white whiskers with his knuckles. Why, he just quit the way a guy will. Says it was the food. Just wanted to move. Didn't give no other reason but the food. Just says, give me my time one night, the way any guy would. George lifted his tick and looked underneath it. He leaned over and inspected the sacking closely. Immediately, Lenny got up and did the same with his bed. Finally, George seemed satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf. His razor and bar of soap, his comb and bottle of pills, liniment and leather wristband. Then he made his bed up neatly with blankets. The old man said, I guess the boss will be out here in a minute. 
He was sure burned when you wasn't here this morning. Come right in when we was eating breakfast and says, Where the hell's them new men? And he give the stable buck hell, too. George patted a wrinkle out of his bed and sat down. Give the stable buck hell, he asked. Sure. You see, the stable buck's a nigger. Nigger, huh? Yeah. Nice feller, too. Got a crooked back where a horse kicked him. The boss gives him hell when he's mad. But the stable buck don't give a damn about that. He reads a lot. Got books in his room. What kind of a guy is the boss, George asked. Well, he's a pretty nice feller. Gets pretty mad sometimes, but he's pretty nice. Tell you what, know what he done Christmas? Bring a gallon of whiskey right in here and says, Drink hearty, boys. Christmas comes but once a year. The hell he did. Whole gallon? Yes, sir. Jesus, we had fun. They let the nigger come in that night. Little Skinner, named Smitty, took after the nigger. Done pretty good, too. The guys wouldn't let him use his feet, so the nigger got him. If he could have used his feet, Smitty says he would have killed the nigger. The guy said on account of the nigger's got a crooked back, Smitty can't use his feet. He paused in relish of the memory. After that, the guys went into Soledad and raised hell. I didn't go in there. I ain't got the poop no more. Lenny was just finishing making his bed. The wooden latch raised again and the door opened. A little stocky man stood in the open doorway. He wore blue jean trousers, a flannel shirt, a black unbuttoned vest, and a black coat. His thumbs were stuck in his belt on each side of a square steel buckle. On his head was a soiled brown Stetson hat, and he wore high-heeled boots and spurs to prove he was not a laboring man. The old swamper looked quickly at him and then shuffled to the door, rubbing his whiskers with his knuckles as he went. Them guys just come, he said, and shuffled past the boss and out the door. The boss stepped into the room with the short, quick steps of a fat-legged man. I wrote Murray and Reddy I wanted two men this morning. You got your work slips? George reached into his pocket and produced the slips and handed them to the boss. It wasn't Murray and Reddy's fault, says right here on the slip, that you was to be here for work this morning. George looked down at his feet. Bus driver give us a bum steer, he said. We had to walk ten miles. Says we was here when we wasn't. We couldn't get no rides in the morning. The boss squinted his eyes. Well, I had to send out the grain team short two buckers. Won't do any good to go out now till after dinner. He pulled his time book out of his pocket and opened it where a pencil was stuck between the leaves. George scowled meaningfully at Lenny, and Lenny nodded to show that he understood. The boss licked his pencil. What's your name? George Milton. And what's yours? George said. His name's Lenny Small. The names were entered in the book. Let's see, this is the 20th, noon the 20th. He closed the book. Where you boys been working? Up around Weed, said George. You too? To Lenny. Yeah, him too, said George. The boss pointed a playful finger at Lenny. He ain't much of a talker, is he? No, he ain't. But he's sure a hell of a good worker, strong as a bull. Lenny smiled to himself. Strong as a bull, he repeated. George scowled at him, and Lenny dropped his head in shame at having forgotten. The boss said suddenly, Listen, Small. Lenny raised his head. What can you do? In a panic, Lenny looked at George for help. He can do anything you tell him, said George. He's a good skinner. He can rassle grain bags, drive a cultivator. He can do anything. Just give him a try. The boss turned on George. Then why don't you let him answer? What are you trying to put over? George broke in loudly. Oh, I ain't saying he's bright. He ain't. But I say he's a goddamn good worker. He can put up a 400-pound bale. The boss deliberately put the little book in his pocket. He hooked his thumbs in his belt and squinted one eye nearly closed. Say, what are you selling? Huh? I said, what stake you got in this guy? You taking his pay away from him? No, of course I ain't. 
Why do you think I'm selling them out? Well, I never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. I'd just like to know what your interest is. George said, He's my cousin. I told his old lady I'd take care of him. Got kicked in the head by a horse when he was a kid. He's all right, just ain't bright. But he can do anything you tell him. The boss turned half away. Well, God knows he don't need any brains to buck barley bags. But don't you try to put nothing over, Milton. I got my eye on you. Why'd you quit and weed? Job was done, said George promptly. What kind of job? We... we was digging a cesspool. All right. But don't try to put nothing over, because you can't get away with nothing. I seen wise guys before. Go on out with the grain teams after dinner. They're picking up barley at the threshing machine. Go out with Slim's team. Slim? Yeah, big, tall Skinner. You'll see him at dinner. He turned abruptly and went to the door. But before he went out, he turned and looked for a long moment at the two men. When the sound of his footsteps had died away, George turned on Lenny. So you wasn't going to say a word. You was going to leave your big flapper shut and leave me do the talking. Damn near lost us the job. Lenny stared hopelessly at his hands. I forgot, George. Yeah, you forgot. You always forget. And I got to talk you out of it. He sat down heavily on the bunk. Now he's got his eye on us. Now we got to be careful and not make no slips. You keep your big flapper shut after this. He fell morosely silent. George, what do you want now? I wasn't kicked in the head with no horse, was I, George? Be a damn good thing if you was, George said viciously. Save everybody a hell of a lot of trouble. You said I was your cousin, George. Well, that was a lie. And I'm damn glad it was. If I was a relative of yours, I'd shoot myself. He stopped suddenly, stepped to the open front door and peered out. Say, what the hell you doing listening? The old man came slowly into the room. He had his broom in his hand, and at his heels there walked a drag-footed sheepdog, gray of muzzle and with pale, blind old eyes. The dog struggled lamely to the side of the room and lay down, grunting softly to himself and licking his grizzled, moth-eaten coat. The swamper watched him until he was settled. I wasn't listening. I was just standing in the shade a minute, scratching my dog. I just now finished swamping out the wash house. You was poking your big ears into our business, George said. I don't like nobody to get nosy. The old man looked uneasily from George to Lenny and then back. I just come there, he said. I didn't hear nothing you guys was saying. I ain't interested in nothing you was saying. A guy on a ranch don't never listen... Nor he don't ask no questions. Damn right he don't, said George, slightly mollified. Not if he wants to stay working long. But he was reassured by the swamper's defense. Come on and sit down a minute, he said. That's a hell of an old dog. Yeah. I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheepdog when he was younger. He stood his broom against the wall and he rubbed his white bristle cheek with his knuckles. How'd you like the boss, he asked. Pretty good. Seemed all right. He's a nice feller, the swamper agreed. You gotta take him right. At that moment, a young man came into the bunkhouse. A thin young man, with a brown face, with brown eyes and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and, like the boss, he wore high-heeled boots. Seen my old man? he asked. The swamper said, He was here just a minute ago, Curly. Went over to the cookhouse, I think. I'll try to catch him, said Curly. His eyes passed over the new men, then he stopped. He glanced coldly at George, and then at Lenny. His arms gradually bent at the elbows, and his hands closed into fists. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. Lenny squirmed under the look and shifted his feet nervously. 
Curly stepped gingerly close to him. You the new guys the old man was waiting for? We just come in, said George. Let the big guy talk. Lenny twisted with embarrassment. George says, Suppose you don't want to talk. Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's got to talk when he spoke to. What the hell are you getting into it for? We travel together, said George coldly. Oh, so it's that way. George was tense and motionless. Yeah, it's that way. Lenny was looking helplessly to George for instruction. And you won't let the big guy talk, is that it? He can talk if he wants to tell you anything. He nodded slightly to Lenny. We just come in, said Lenny softly. Curly stared levelly at him. Well, next time you answer when you spoke to. He turned toward the door and walked out, and his elbows were still bent out a little. George watched him out, and then he turned back to the swamper. Say, what the hell's he got on his shoulder? Lenny didn't do nothing to him. The old man looked cautiously at the door to make sure no one was listening. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight and he's handy. Well, let him be handy, said George. He don't have to take after Lenny. Lenny didn't do nothing to him. What's he got against Lenny? The swamper considered. Well, tell you what. Curly's like a lot of little guys. He hates big guys. He's all the time picking scraps with big guys. Kind of like he's mad at them because he ain't a big guy. You've seen little guys like that, ain't you? Always scrappy? Sure, said George. I've seen plenty of tough little guys. But this Curly better not make no mistakes about Lenny. Lenny ain't handy, but this Curly punk is going to get hurt if he messes around with Lenny. Well, Curly's pretty handy, the swamper said skeptically. Never did seem right to me. Suppose Curly jumps a big guy and licks him. Everybody says what a game guy Curly is. And suppose he does the same thing and gets licked. Then everybody says the big guy ought to pick somebody his own size, and maybe they gang up on the big guy. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't given nobody a chance. George was watching the door. He said ominously, well, he better watch out for Lenny. Lenny ain't no fighter, but Lenny's strong and quick, and Lenny don't know no rules. He walked to the square table and sat down on one of the boxes. He gathered some of the cards together and shuffled them. The old man sat down on another box. Don't tell Curly I said none of this. He'd slough me. He just don't give a damn. Won't ever get canned, because his old man's the boss. George cut the cards and began throwing them over, looking at each one and throwing it down on a pile. He said, This guy Curly sounds like a son of a bitch to me. I don't like mean little guys. Seems to me like he's worse lately, said the swamper. He got married a couple of weeks ago. Wife lives over in the boss's house. Seems like Curly is cockier than ever since he got married. George grunted. Maybe he's showing off for his wife. The swamper warmed to his gossip. You seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah, I seen it. Well, that glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I'll tell you what. Curly says he's keeping that hand soft for his wife. George studied the cards absorbedly. That's a dirty thing to tell around, he said. The old man was reassured. He had drawn a derogatory statement from George. He felt safe now, and he spoke more confidently. Where do you see Curly's wife? George cut the cards again and put out a solitaire lay, slowly and deliberately. Purdy, he asked casually. Yeah, Purdy, but... George studied his cards. 
But what? Well, she got the eye. Yeah? Married two weeks and got the eye? Maybe that's why Curly's pants is full of ants. I seen her give Slim the eye. Slim's a jerk-line skinner. Hell of a nice feller. Slim don't need to wear no high-heeled boots on a grain team. I seen her give Slim the eye. Curly never seen it. And I seen her give Carlson the eye. George pretended a lack of interest. Looks like we was going to have fun. The swamper stood up from his box. Know what I think? George did not answer. Well, I think Curly's married a tart. He ain't the first, said George. There's plenty done that. The old man moved toward the door, and his ancient dog lifted his head and peered about, and then got painfully to his feet to follow. I gotta be setting out the wash basins for the guys. The teams will be in before long. You guys gonna buck barley? Yeah. You won't tell Curly nothing I said? Hell no. Well, you look her over, mister. You see if she ain't a tart... He stepped out the door into the brilliant sunshine. George laid down his cards thoughtfully, turned his piles of three. He built four clubs on his ace pile. The sun square was on the floor now, and the flies whipped through it like sparks. A sound of jingling harness and the croak of heavy-laden axles sounded from outside. From the distance came a clear call. Stable buck! Oh, stable buck! And then, where the hell is that goddamn nigger? George stared at his solitaire lay, and then he flounced the cards together and turned around to Lenny. Lenny was lying down on the bunk, watching him. Look, Lenny, this here ain't no setup. I'm scared. You're going to have trouble with that curly guy. I seen that kind before. He was kind of feeling you out. He figures he's got you scared, and he's going to take a sock at you the first chance he gets. Lenny's eyes were frightened. I don't want no trouble, he said plaintively. Don't let him sock me, George. George got up and went over to Lenny's bunk and sat down on it. I hate that kind of bastard, he said. I've seen plenty of them. Like the old guy says, Curly don't take no chances. He always wins. He thought for a moment. If he tangles with you, Lenny, we're going to get the can. Don't make no mistake about that. He's the boss's son. Look, Lenny, you try to keep away from him, will you? Don't never speak to him. If he comes in here, you move clear to the other side of the room. Will you do that, Lenny? I don't want no trouble, Lenny mourned. I never done nothing to him. Well, that won't do you no good if Curly wants to plug himself up for a fighter. Just don't have nothing to do with him, will you remember? Sure, George. I ain't gonna say a word. The sound of the approaching grain teams was louder. Thud of big hooves on hard ground, drag of brakes, and the jingle of trace chains. Men were calling back and forth from the teams. George, sitting on the bunk beside Lenny, frowned as he thought. Lenny asked timidly, You ain't mad, George. I ain't mad at you. I'm mad at this here curly bastard. I hoped we was going to get a little stake together, maybe a hundred dollars. His tone grew decisive. You keep away from curly, Lenny. Sure I will, George. I won't say a word. Don't let him pull you in, but if the son of a bitch socks you, let him have it. Let him have what, George? Never mind, never mind. I'll tell you when. I hate that kind of a guy. Look, Lenny, if you get in any kind of trouble, do you remember what I told you to do? Lenny raised up on his elbow, his face contorted with thought. Then his eyes moved sadly to George's face. If I get in any trouble, you ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. That's not what I meant. You remember where we slept last night down by the river? Yeah, I remember. Oh, sure, I remember. I go there and hide in the brush. Hide till I come for you. Don't let nobody see you. Hide in the brush by the river. Say that over. Hide in the brush by the river. Down in the brush by the river. If you get in trouble. If I 
get in trouble. A brake screeched outside. A call came, Stable Buck! Oh, Stable Buck! George said, Say it over to yourself, Lenny, so you won't forget it. Both men glanced up, for the rectangle of sunshine in the doorway was cut off. A girl was standing there, looking in. She had full, rouged lips and wide-spaced eyes, heavily made up. Her fingernails were red. Her hair hung in little rolled clusters like sausages. She wore a cotton house dress and red mules, on the insteps of which were little bouquets of red ostrich feathers. I'm looking for Curly, she said. Her voice had a nasal, brittle quality. George looked away from her and then back. He was in here a minute ago, but he went. Oh. She put her hands behind her back and leaned against the door frame so that her body was thrown forward. You're the new fellow that just come, ain't you? Yeah. Lenny's eyes moved down over her body, and though she did not seem to be looking at Lenny, she bridled a little. She looked at her fingernails. Sometimes Curly's in here, she explained. George said brusquely, Well, he ain't now. If he ain't, I guess I'd better look someplace else, she said playfully. Lenny watched her, fascinated. George said, If I see him, I'll pass the word you was looking for him. She smiled archly and twitched her body. Nobody can't blame a person for looking, she said. There were footsteps behind her going by. She turned her head. Hi, Slim, she said. Slim's voice came through the door. Hi, good looking. I'm trying to find Curly, Slim. Well, you ain't trying very hard. I seen him going in your house. She was suddenly apprehensive. Bye, boys, she called into the bunkhouse. And she hurried away. George looked around at Lenny. Jesus, what a tramp, he said. So that's what Curly picks for a wife. She's pretty, said Lenny defensively. Yeah, and she's sure hiding it. Curly got his work ahead of him. Bet she'd clear out for twenty bucks. Lenny still stared at the doorway where she had been. Gosh, she was pretty. He smiled admiringly. George looked quickly down at him, and then he took him by an ear and shook him. Listen to me, you crazy bastard, he said fiercely. Don't you even take a look at that bitch. I don't care what she says and what she does. I seen him poisoned before, but I never seen no piece of jail bait worse than her. You leave her be. Then he tried to disengage his ear. I never done nothing, George. No, you never. But when she was standing in the doorway showing her legs, you wasn't looking the other way, neither. I never meant no harm, George. Honest, I never. Well, you keep away from her, because she's a rat trap if I ever seen one. You let Curly take the rap. He let himself in for it. Glove full of Vaseline, George said disgustedly. And I bet he's eating raw eggs and right into the patent medicine houses. Then he cried out suddenly, I don't like this place, George. This ain't no good place. I want to get out of here. We got to keep it till we get a stake. We can't help it, Lenny. We'll get out just as soon as we can. I don't like it no better than you do. He went back to the table and set out a new solitaire hand. No, I don't like it, he said. For two bits, I'd shove out of here. If we can just get a few dollars in the poke, we'll shove off and go up the American River and pan gold. We can make maybe a couple of dollars a day there, and we might hit a pocket. Lenny leaned eagerly toward him. Let's go, George. Let's get out of here. It's mean here. We gotta stay, George said shortly. Shut up now. The guys will be coming in. From the washroom nearby came the sound of running water and rattling basins. George studied the cards. Maybe we ought to wash up, he said. But we ain't done nothing to get dirty. A tall man stood in the doorway. He held a crushed Stetson hat under his arm while he combed his long, black, damp 
hair straight back. Like the others, he wore blue jeans and a short denim jacket. When he had finished combing his hair, he moved into the room, and he moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. He was a jerkline skinner, the prince of the ranch, capable of driving ten, sixteen, even twenty mules with a single line to the leaders. He was capable of killing a fly on the wheeler's butt with a bullwhip without touching the mule. There was a gravity in his manner, and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. This was Slim, the jerkline Skinner. His hatchet face was ageless. He might have been thirty-five or fifty. His ear heard more than was said to him, and his slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of understanding beyond thought. His hands, large and lean, were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer. He smoothed out his crushed hat, creased it in the middle, and put it on. He looked kindly at the two in the bunkhouse. It's brighter than a bitch outside, he said gently. Can't hardly see nothing in here. You the new guys? Just come, said George. Gonna buck barley? That's what the boss says. Slim sat down on a box across the table from George. He studied the solitaire hand that was upside down to him. Hope you get on my team, he said. His voice was very gentle. I got a pair of punks on my team that don't know a barley bag from a blue ball. You guys ever bucked any barley? Hell yes, said George. I ain't nothing to scream about, but that big bastard there can put up more grain alone than most pears can. Lenny, who had been following the conversation back and forth with his eyes, smiled complacently at the compliment. Slim looked approvingly at George for having given the compliment. He leaned over the table and snapped the corner of a loose card. You guys travel around together? His tone was friendly. It invited confidence without demanding it. Sure, said George. We kind of look after each other. He indicated Lenny with his thumb. He ain't bright. Hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice feller, but he ain't bright. I've knew him for a long time. Slim looked through George and beyond him. Ain't many guys travel around together, he mused. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. It's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know, said George. A powerful, big-stomached man came into the bunkhouse. His head still dripped water from the scrubbing and dousing. Hi, Slim, he said, and then stopped and stared at George and Lenny. These guys just come, said Slim, by way of introduction. Glad to meet you, the big man said. My name's Carlson. I'm George Milton. This here's Lenny Small. Glad to meet you, Carlson said. He ain't very small. He chuckled softly at his joke. Ain't small at all, he repeated. Meant to ask you, Slim, how's your bitch? I seen she wasn't under your wagon this morning. She slang her pups last night, said Slim, nine of them. I drowned four of them right off. She couldn't feed that many. Got five left, huh? Yeah, five. I kept the biggest. What kind of dogs you think they're going to be? I don't know, said Slim. Some kind of shepherds, I guess. That's the most kind I seen around here when she was in heat. Carlson went on. Got five pups, huh? Going to keep all of them? I don't know. Have to keep them a while so they can drink Lulu's milk. Carlson said thoughtfully. Well, look here, Slim. I've been thinking. That dog of candy is so goddamn old he can't hardly walk. Stinks like hell, too. Every time he comes into the bunkhouse, I can smell him for two, three days. Why don't you get Candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up? I can smell that dog a mile away. Got no teeth, damn near blind, can't eat. Candy feeds him milk. He can't chew nothing else. George had been staring intently at Slim. Suddenly a triangle began to ring outside, slowly at first and then faster and faster 
until the beat of it disappeared into one ringing sound. It stopped as suddenly as it had started. There she goes, said Carlson. Outside there was a burst of voices as a group of men went by. Slim stood up slowly and with dignity. You guys better come on while there's still something to eat. Won't be nothing left in a couple of minutes. Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him, and then the two of them went out of the door. Lenny was watching George excitedly. George rumpled his cards into a messy pile. Yeah, George said, I heard him, Lenny. I'll ask him. A brown and white one, Lenny cried excitedly. Come on, let's get dinner. I don't know whether he's got a brown and white one. Lenny didn't move from his bunk. You ask him right away, George, so he won't kill no more of them. Sure, come on now, get up on your feet. Lenny rolled off his bunk and stood up, and the two of them started for the door. Just as they reached it, Curly bounced in. You seen a girl around here? He demanded angrily. George said coldly, About a half an hour ago, maybe. What the hell was she doing? George stood still, watching the angry little man. He said insultingly, She said she was looking for you. Curly seemed really to see George for the first time. His eyes flashed over George, took in his height, measured his reach, looked at his trim middle. Well, which way'd she go, he demanded at last. I don't know, said George. I didn't watch her go. Curly scowled at him, and turning, hurried out the door. George said, You know, Lenny, I'm scared I'm going to tangle with that bastard myself. I hate his guts. Jesus Christ. Come on, there won't be a damn thing left to eat. They went out of the door. The sunshine lay in a thin line under the window. From a distance there could be heard a rattle of dishes. After a moment the ancient dog walked lamely in through the open door. He gazed about with mild, half-blind eyes. He sniffed and then lay down and put his head between his paws. Curly popped into the doorway again and stood looking into the room. The dog raised his head, but when Curly jerked out, the grizzled head sank to the floor again.